Hi, I'm Daniel, and before the episode starts, I want to briefly talk to you about the Garden Outreach Project, a WCF program focused on putting faith into action. Our mission is to inspire and support Christadelphians in North America to share Christ's love through outreach initiatives. This is done by facilitating national and local outreach activities, supplying resources, and providing funds to help brothers and sisters serve those in need. For example, in 2020, over 40 ecclesial groups participated in our Bags of Love initiative, which saw over 800 sleeping bags distributed to shelters and those without a home. If you, your ecclesia, or CYC want to learn more and get involved with our latest initiative, please visit our website at www.thegardenoutreach.org. You can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram at The Garden Outreach for the latest news and encouragement. And now, here's the show. Welcome back to Little Faith. I'm Levi, and I'm here with Peter Clausen. How are you doing, Peter? I'm doing very well. Thank you, Levi. It's a treat to see you. It's been too long, and it's so good to see you as well. You had some health problems, but it's also just been a crazy year for everybody. What's your year been like? I think one, the beginning, like a year ago, when we first got into this pandemic, the challenge was with uh, the music that I was doing uh, frequently in a number of places and and having lots of activities revolving around that and singing, just everything was pretty much normal, which I loved. However, everything just stopped short and said, okay, you can't do that. And it became one of a challenge just trying to stay motivated and involved when you couldn't have any performances or you couldn't uh, make music with others, which is part of my life for sure. So I found it challenging to, to live through that. And then we got through the holidays and the same thing was going on with the holidays and, and it wasn't quite the same. And, and then when uh, January rolled around, we were still in the kind of a void. All of a sudden, one morning I woke up and I felt like my right leg and my right arm were still asleep and yeah. uh, walked down to the piano and sat down at the piano and started to play. And my left hand did fine. And my right hand was like a two-year-old sitting on my lap, pounding at the keys. It was just wow. like being a different person entirely or like starting my life again. And I was still yeah. you know, barely able to play the piano with my right hand. <laughs> Um, um, so that was a shock. So we went to the hospital and fortunately my wife took me there and, and they were extraordinary with me and, and they analyzed me and then finally determined it was a stroke and uh, started doing tests on my, on all the, the veins and all the things that get blood to the brain and all those kind of things and determined that most of those look good, but I still had a stroke. So uh, after all the tests and about three or four days in the hospital, uh, they determined that, you know, what it was and what I'm going to need. And I was just thinking, I just can't wait to get home because the hospital is not a fun place to be yeah. usually. Right. And when I was talking to the doctor, trying to find out when I'd be actually released, he said, it would be ideal if you could get to therapy right away. And I'm going, oh, where would that be? And he said, well, we have a facility and I can check and uh, it's a fabulous rehabilitation type therapy. And I can check and see if they have a bed available. And he came back later that day and said, yes, there's a bed available. And they're expecting you this evening. And I said, yeah. wow. So uh, wow. a short ride in the back of an ambulance after dark. I, I didn't know where I went. I went yeah. up in a building uh, knowing it wasn't far from the hospital, but where, I don't know. And yeah. I was admitted about 10 o'clock at night and uh, went to bed pretty soon and slept through the night, woke up the next morning, and then all these wonderful people came in to, to assist me with all the things I needed, and they made me feel like I was at a spa, <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and they were just wonderful. And then they scheduled the therapy, and the therapists were extraordinary as well, like my best friends. However, they had a goal of making sure that I got better. <laughs> they were excellent in how they approached it by, I never thought they were doing a job. I thought they were my best friends and they wanted the best for me and, and they wanted right. to keep encouraging me and pushing me forward. Every day I would have a speech therapy and then occupational therapy and then music therapy and then physical therapy. You know, wow. 
was most of the day. And they were extraordinary in how they applied everything. And they helped me understand little things that I didn't know. I, I right. We get to a point in our lives where we do things automatically until they don't happen. And now, yeah. it's, how do I make them happen again? Because I can't yeah. start at two years old and, and work this thing out over the years. So if they gave me exactly what I needed to do to improve. They showed me the muscles that controlled how I walk evenly. And they showed me the right hand, how the fine dexterity goes and how you button a shirt. Like I'm, I put on the shirt today and I could call yeah. it therapy. Uh, <laughs> I tied the tie. I can make, I call that therapy now because right. for, for quite a while, I couldn't tie the tie. I, I put it on my left hand and start my and then so the brain is going, okay, right. And take over. I'm, what do I do? It, yeah. it just wasn't there. And Weird. I said, you know how to do this. You've been doing this all your life. Come on, just do right. it. And, and it right. didn't. And so it huh. took me figuring out what it takes to tie a tie cerebrally so that I can understand right. what it is. And then to train the right hand how to do that as if you were starting over again. The fear I had originally was that if the piano could just barely play the piano, I don't have time left in my life to get back to where I was before. Oh. <laughs> it's going to take too many years. But yeah. as God always does, he never gives us more than we can handle. And he, right. he allowed me to improve day by day as if I was going month by month and even year by year. And so I'd go from zero to to 60 in, in one day, and then I keep going. It's been really a wonderful experience to realize how incredible the brain he gives us is and how we learn to, to do things and how we find if the road is closed, we find a detour somewhere and we go around and we come back out the other end. And it takes a yeah. while to figure that out, but it works. I was all my life in a vein of saying, my left brain was there when I learned about music and how to play notes and all these kinds of things. And then I'm pretty much done with the left brain. Now I'm in the right brain, which is where we take music from the page and make it come to life. But without that, it's just kind of computer type music. It doesn't have the emotional feeling that it needs. And, and so I'm saying the right brain is there. It knows what it wants, but the right hand, which is controlled by the left brain, <laughs> isn't responding. And so right. I, I could feel what I wanted, but I couldn't do it. And fascinating. It, it, it is a fascinating thing. But fortunately, God kept saying, keep on going. And my therapist kept trying this, try that. See if you can do this. And I would do it. And they, oh, great. You know, see if you can do this. Oh, good. That's, that's wonderful. You know, all the positive reinforcement one needs to keep on going and working right. as hard as you possibly can. Because in the morning, I'd wake up with lots of energy. And I'd go to therapy and I'd come back to the bedroom going, oh, I'm so fortunately, uh, Brother Greg Wakert, a, a brother in our collegium, was good enough to come over to the house and pick up my keyboard and bring it over to the rehab center and set it up in, in, the, in the bedroom that I had there uh, under the window. So I could sit there and, and start playing the piano and start realizing that, oh, it's coming back. I'm doing this. I'm doing this and so forth. And it, it just is mind boggling what you can yeah. do with God's blessing and his encouragement and practice. I, I should do some sort of an introduction for anyone who's never had the pleasure of meeting you, but you, you, music is a huge part of your life. Uh, besides, you're, you're very involved any time that, that you're at a gathering or your church's events or anything like that, but you also, you, you work with the symphony, right? Or you did before COVID? Yes, I'm in the Cleveland Orchestra Chorus. And so when right. we do a, a work that involves a choir, we, the choir, sing that. So it's a nice. huge privilege to sing with one of the best orchestras in the world and to, right. to make music come to life and so forth. So I, I get a lot of training there. And it, it was amazingly helpful because when the speech, speech therapist said to me, you're tending to swallow your last syllable or your last consonant isn't getting enunciated, you know, then I could revert to my musical training and experience of the chorus where we always... <laughs> We have to make sure that the audience hears and understands what we're singing. So I had right. to go into a uh, kind of a, a musical overlay on top of yeah. the spoken voice. Use the rules from here and bring them back to here and then really enunciate very carefully. And when one thinks yeah. about it, one can do it. Normally, when we're talking, we don't think much about that. But there right. are so many uh, issues in music with a long note or in a hymn like we've seen on Sunday. The, we get to a long note. The normal 
feeling is that you would get to the note and put the consonant on the end of it, except if you've got four more beats or three more beats to sing before you're done. So it's the con concept of saying, I'm singing the word no for note, and I'm going no, -ch, and that's where the T right. goes. And so even though it, it's not going to be delayed in speaking, whereas music, you'd hold it and do something with it and then put it on. At least I could have that cerebral ability to say, I need that T. Otherwise, the word is no and not no, -ch, or the word, yeah. word is life and not lie. But there's so right. many things where a consonant can make an entirely big difference. So it, it, I was blessed, as God always does, with what I needed to be able to apply my thinking toward achieving what I needed to do to improve. Interesting. Amazing. And you had your stroke in January. When did you, and then you were in the hospital for how long? And then four how days. long were you at the facility? Four days oh, at the hospital. Prob four days hospital and almost four weeks at the facility. Wow. Uh, I kept thinking so I'd be going, going home. home You've been home for a few weeks then now. It's the middle of April. Right. I think I got home yeah. in late February. So I've been home okay. since then. Yeah. Good. And I started out in the hospital in a wheelchair. And then I was yeah. at rehab with a therapist. I was in a wheelchair all the time, unless I was working with them on something specific. Back to the wheelchair to go back to my room, whatever. And you have this requirement. You don't get out of the wheelchair unless you have somebody with you. Because oh, right. one, they want to make sure you don't fall and then and need more therapy and at the same time be protective of you. They were good about that. And then finally, on the day I left the, the rehab facility and, and my wife, Melanie, picked me up, they wheeled me out to the car and I got in the car and, and, uh, and we drove home. And it was only then where I started to be able to move around a little bit on my own and found that I carefully could walk. Right. I had done so much therapy. That leg was there to do what it needed to do. Now I'm careful that I'm interesting enough, not talking as I'm turning and walking, uh, because the brain is only capable of so many things at first. And you have to reincorporate those things and, and make them automatic so that you can do multiple things at the same time. And wow. I found that I, I need to make sure that I'm backing up. I'm a little more careful than I normally would be. Or if I'm going down the stairs and I'm carrying something, ah, now be careful how you do that, you know? So there are little nuances that I'm finding are necessary in order for me to do well and not fall and improve. And even on the stairs now, I walk upstairs and, and as I step on a step, I'll step there and then I'll, then I'll put my heel off of the step and practice lowering my heel down and back up again because that was what I was learning in therapy. So all these things in therapy can be done, a lot of them at least, not near at home. And then yeah. in my outpatient therapy, which I went to at the hospital with other therapists, I spent everything until last Friday with them, usually five sessions a week of, of therapy as well. And again, they were taking me to the next step and to the next level. And they were extraordinary and so motivating that I just had to do it. And, yeah. and I, I once again go out there in the morning and then I get, get ready to come home and, and I'm just exhausted like I need a nap. <laughs> and <laughs> sleeping is good for people that have had a stroke. Sleep is good for the brain to help recover. I mean, so I sleep more than I normally would. Good. But now I've been de determined to have what they call sleep apnea. And that's what mm -hmm. really caused the stroke in the beginning. So we're now defining what it was. and. Today is Wednesday, so Friday I go to location and pick up an apnea mask and mask, yeah. that. It's funny. I have a coworker that I travel with. We go on you know work trips, and he has had sleep apnea for years, and he's always it, so we, <laughs> that's his carry on. So he carries. We get on the airplane back when we could fly, and he's rolling his bag, and then he's right. got his sleep apnea mask that he carries on, and it's obviously important, but it's because he he needs it for his good sleep. But. Exactly. I hear that's what's important. My son in love, uh, Guy Custer, I found out now has sleep apnea for a couple of years now. And he mm -hmm. says it makes a huge difference. I was in my mind thought of people doing that saying, oh, it's got to be an inconvenience and all that. But he said his sleep has improved dramatically. I mm -hmm. was determined that when I did a sleep study at the hospital, they said you have 54 instances over each hour where you are not breathing when you should. Oh, wow. It's almost one a minute. Yeah, that's crazy. And, and and apparently one, at least one went 
way too long and and we didn't get oxygen to the brain where i needed it so uh, that was the reason for the stroke so yeah. um, i'm hearing now that it will change my life so i'm i'm looking forward to not having to sleep as much as i have been recently and being yeah. able to have that renewed energy from that but again improve with everything else i'm finding the piano is getting better every day it's, it's like such a blessing to to wake up and sit on the piano oh i couldn't do that yesterday <laughs> no i can do it no uh, it just keeps getting better every day god is so good to us oh yeah i can't imagine you're the scare you'd be under knowing that you might not be able to play again i can't even that that would be heartbreaking for a moment it was and i yeah. said no wait God does provide, and yeah. I know he'll do it. The other thing Good. I should warn you about is that <laughs> one of the things with a stroke is that your emotional governor gets <laughs> broken, and I can go from being serious to crying in a heartbeat, and so I have to be careful <laughs> with that. So, <laughs> Peter, I would say your emotional governor was already gone before that happened, so we're, we're, all, okay. Totally. we're all okay. You're very, you've, you've always been very pure and, and, and beautiful with what you're feeling. So it's now on a very short trigger too. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. No, it, it, that, thanks for, I, I'm, I'm sure that nobody will be bothered, but it's good to explain why that's happening. I think it's yeah. been fascinating you talking about recircuiting and because yeah, there's, it's crazy how many things we don't even think about that we do, how many operations right. our brain does in our body that we don't even think about. Like, actually, I just realized while I was talking to you, I just scratched my shoulder and I scratched my ear, you know, because yeah. I had an itch, but I was saying yeah. something to you. But my, my, I didn't even ever decide to do that. You know, my brain just right. controlled my fingers up to do that while it's we're having amazing. this conversation. It's amazing. There was a story, just to share a little bit about right brain, left brain, and all this stuff. A story uh, that I read years ago, because I always was curious about why I felt more right brain and more creative. And I did, I did a test on the internet. And in 21 questions, and they said, answer the first question. Uh, it's really a multiple choice. Answer with your first instinct and go with it. I did all 21 questions. And out of 21, I had 21 right brain answers. So I was <laughs> not, not using this brain over here much at all. And yeah. I, I could understand why I felt different than a lot of people, because it just isn't the same. A lot of people love mathematics and stuff like that. And for a time, I did get into that with learning music. And I said, oh, we're done with that now. It didn't float my boat anymore. But now I'm realizing what it does and, and why the brains are so incredible and why we as humans can start to apply a thought process to saying, maybe I need to be in my right brain more often than I'm not. Maybe I need to take singing hymns on, at meeting on Sunday with more emotion to make them come to life instead of singing almost as if we are an automatic pilot and just going through the process and wondering what if the, if the roast will be done before we get home and all that kind of stuff, which we can do because we can multitask up here. But there are times when we probably shouldn't be multitasking. And so right. we have to consciously be aware that we need to put everything we're doing in the right perspective. And the, the issue that came out of the study, I had looked on the internet, there was a story about a, a gentleman that had been in a horrible a car accident. And apparently something in the car had, had cut down the back of his head and sliced it open and actually separated his left brain from the right brain. And there's an organ called the corpus callosum that connects the two together. And what we'd call the computer business, we call it a bus, but it connects them together. And we use that connection all day long to make things happen, you know? And what I learned from that was that in his instance, it had separated and totally separated the, the two brains. So he had a left brain and a right brain, and they could not communicate. But mm. the doctors had an opportunity to see what that does. And they somehow they were able to plug into his left brain only, and they would show him a coffee cup. What's this? Oh, it's a coffee cup. What are you going to do with it? I don't know. And they said, it's a coffee cup. <laughs> and, and they go, I don't know. And then they plugged into the right brain. What's this? She, I don't know what that is. How do you <laughs> think you could use that? And they said, it's got a handle on it. You could probably put liquid in it. You could drink it. But what's it called? I don't know. And, and those are the things where the brains work together so beautifully, so perfectly. Wow. Only God could do that. <laughs> 
and to, to, to set that up. And, and so, you know, apparently they were able to put them back together again, but that was an opportunity to do something that we would probably never do intentionally. Yeah. Wow. I guess split brain theory won the Nobel prize for science in, in the early eighties. And it was this study on the, on the man who had the split brain. Okay. Interesting. okay yeah. Fascinating. We take so, so much for granted and, and you've gone through an amazing experience where you've you know, seen the loss, but you have most of it back or you're on your way back. That is quite a blessing. Oh, I, you know, I can't tell you in words. I can't yeah. I have to share with you in the future with music. That's the only thing yeah. I could best <laughs> describe this. Yeah, I liked your point about how we have to, we need to be focusing on the things that we're doing in the moment. And I've, I've been thinking a lot about that with hymns, how if the words are important, what you're saying is important, but if the emotion is not there, what are you doing? You know, exactly. If the feeling right. is not there, what is it a performance? You know, no, it's not a performance. It has to be something that elicits a feeling in you. Exactly. Yeah. And, and it has and it to is, be. You're, you're right. It's a good point about the performance. We're not performing, but we want, right. want to share with God our joy and, and just wondrous feeling about what we can do here. Not that yeah. we can multitask and think about the roast at the same time or, or the football game that will be on this afternoon. We are so amazing with our um, intellectual qualities that we can multitask all kinds of things, but do we get what we want out of it at the time? And I submit that Sunday morning isn't a time to be multitasking regarding other things in your life. (laughs) It's about him. And he is so good to us by allowing us that privilege. And we have a lot of us have to, especially a lot of men. I I don't actually uh, admit to being a total man, because there are a lot of feminine feelings in my heart, my mind, and my and singing that that I I blend together. So I think of myself as my mixture, but the concept of being able to get emotional about what you're singing and really get involved and change the volume and and downplay the particles uh, of the hymn verse and pl- and and play up the the verb or the nouns and that are so critical. And we tend to sing because we're most of us don't have a lot of background in singing, we tend to sing almost as if we're doing everything the same. Every word is the same importance and so forth. And so we have a monotone speaking while we're singing because we aren't feeling the difference between those lyrics. But if we put into play a concept of I want to bring out the word the Lord instead of the Lord, I, I find a huge difference in how I feel about it. And when I feel better about it, I do better. My thought process better. My I incorporate more things that I'm hearing. Uh, it, it's just incomparable how we can do things, but we can get into an, a, a mode where we don't not normally do that without thinking about it. And I would submit that we all ought to be thinking about how we can be more emotional and praise God every time we can. And I do it multiple times. For instance, a lot of us in my age are saying things like, I went up to the bedroom and I could not remember why I went there. And I, and I find myself in the basement where I do some work and I think, oh, I want to go to the bedroom to get something. So I walk upstairs and we have four levels with seven stairs each level, you know, so all the way up and all the way up and I'll get there and going, oh, why did I come up here? It drives me crazy. Then I, I go back downstairs and I go, oh, that's right. I wanted to get my wall because I wanted to pay that bill online or something, you know. Oh, well, okay. But what happens is there's it's a part of our left brain that actually identifies everything our eyes see to allow us to say, oh, there's the couch or there's the TV or there's the kitchen or there's the living room. And so it's automatically doing that all day long. And so I'm trying to get to the bedroom to, to get one thing. And it's saying, gosh, TV, da, 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 oh, flooding me with information that I don't need, right? So that right. can happen. And it, it, it's, it's a struggle to overcome that because you're getting flooded. Every time you go through a door jam, oh, all these new things, you know, here we go. And as I, I did one day, I, was, I don't know what made me do it, but I said to myself, you know what? The right brain could be helpful here because I want to change this from a, an item that I'm trying to get to an experience that I'm trying to achieve. And the right brain is going to be more experiential than the left brain. It's going to be methodical. So I would say to myself, oh, Johnny Cash, he had that wonderful song called I Walk the Line. And so he'd hum and they'd go, I walk the line. Da-da. So I just <laughs> changed the words to, mm, I walk the stairs to get my credit card. I'm going to pay <laughs> that bill online right now. And when I do, I'll be done with that. 
And that's why I walk the stairs like that. You know? And I found <laughs> that every time I get to the bedroom, I know what I want because that, I was singing it in my right brain <laughs> while the left brain is going, couch TV, living room. <laughs> so the right brain can overpower that if you think about it. So it, it's just fascinating. fascinating how that can all work. Yeah. So I, I rarely get anywhere where I don't know what I want because yeah. I sing a lot. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny yeah yeah the, the, it's amazing what you can do to make things more memorable by making that attachment or kind of combining those things and keeps it keeps it sticky keeps that's it right. memorable make, make an experience and we tend not to experience experiences you know when we get older we we forget all the things that we did you know but like yes 30 years ago i did this because it was an experience rather than just an activity and yes. that's critical. The more we do that. So people that are my age and older, remember what they did when they're young, but not so much what they did yesterday. And yeah. that's another part of, did we make that experience or did we make it just an activity? We went? My Actually, my favorite book, I, I've, it's, it, that's not the Bible, obviously, but my favorite book is called Moonwalking with Einstein. It's by huh. Jonathan Safran Foer. It's actually a book all about memory and how to improve your memory. And it highlights these different things, and it makes a couple points I wanted to bring out. One was it talks about how our spatial memory is actually the most powerful memory. Wow. Like you can you can have been to well, like that hospital room or that that where you were for four days. You right. you actually remember tons of information about that room, but you yeah. can't remember what you had for dinner last week, which yeah. doesn't doesn't make sense. Like yeah. the last week was last week, but you have all this information saved in the places that we've been because it's the most powerful form of memory. And then um, exactly. so the other one, and you were talking about experiences, is that this book, Moonwalking with Einstein, talks about, his quote is really good. If you want to live a memorable life, you have to live memorably. You have to live in a way that, that will help you remember the things that you're doing. And, and exactly. the book talks about how your brain doesn't save repeated actions which is why you can't remember what you had for dinner last week. You've sat right. down and had dinner at the table thousands of times. Your brain exactly. doesn't save all those times. You drive through McDonald's and you get a Big Mac. You only you only ever remember what one Big Mac tastes like. You don't remember all the Big Macs that you've ever had. Exactly. Your, your brain just yep. dumps those memories. Yep. And that's how life can feel like it can speed up too. Life sure. speeds up because if you, and I think the pandemic has actually been a really interesting examination of this for a lot of people because your activities became even less and now the, the time went fast because I did the same thing. You know, all the days looked the same and my brain just started dumping the repeated memories. Exactly. So we have, we need to, and, and it all leads back to the same point that you need to be in the moment uh, when, when you're at church or doing whatever, because right. you need to live, you need to live in a focused, memorable way, mm. make that an experience. We need um, to be able to get from a service on Sunday to service on next Sunday throughout the whole week. Yes. So we need to yes. make that in a special experience that we can take with us and recall throughout the week and then get us yes. through to, to Sunday. We do it again. And especially now with the pandemic where we've many of us have not been able to be there and we're right. doing this on television. Now there's an opportunity, unfortunately, where you can forget about that too. I mean, it's just TV. <laughs> it doesn't yeah. have the sensual quality that about being at service on Sunday and all the emotion that comes with that. So we're void of many of the triggers that would bring back what we heard that day. It just seems right. like it's from the wrong environment. So, so true. Uh, I'm hoping that we get back to that soon. Yeah, hopefully very soon. Yes. The brain's an amazing thing, just how, how it connects and how we can feel things. And But again, it is, it, it, it's interesting hearing you talk and thinking all the way back to the beginning, you talked about how to recover your speech, you actually return to some of your choral training to enunciate. Like, and once you focus on enunciating, you actually are speaking better. It's attaching to, to a different experience and then you're seeing progress. But that, that really is also a, a level of focus you need to have no matter what you're doing. Exactly. I need to, I've been trying to be more intentional with my face. I don't know if this makes sense, but I have for years and my friends, people who know me well will be laughing if they hear me say this, but I don't hide my emotions on my face. The, the emotion I'm having is the emotion that's on my face. And right. so I'll be thinking about something that I'm worried about and I'll go full concerned face, you know? And then the problem is someone someone new will come into the room to say hello, someone's coming to the house and I I don't drop this face. You know, I need, I need to go to this face. I need to say, hey, I'm excited <laughs> that you're here, you know? I need to be able to control that deliberate action, you know? Interesting. Yeah, it is. What other uh, lessons would you take from this experience? 
Well, in terms of memory, another one that I learned a long time ago, but which is becoming important as well, and I had the opportunity this over the past several months to use this again, and that is that I took the uh, Dale Carnegie class that about how to win friends and influence people, but that was probably 40 years ago when, it, when I was working, and they teach you about how to remember names because that's critical in the, in the relationships. And they would say, look at the face and associate it with something that makes you remember that name. Connect up the name with that person. And they said there are two important things that you need to do when you meet somebody. And they're very important. He said, the first thing is always introduce yourself first. So, hi, Levi. My name is Peter Clausen. And or rather, hi, uh, my name is Peter Clausen. And you say, oh, hi, my name is Levi Jelenow. And so now... What I've done is your name came up second, and I'm not trying to take my name out of the picture because it's already gone. So I, and so my response is, hi, Levi, how are you? Do you have any brothers and sisters? Did you grow up in this area, Levi? And where did you go to school, Levi? Da, da, you know, all your questions come in with Levi. Now it does two things. People love to hear the name pronounced. They just love it. And number two, you're going memory, 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 <laughs> and right. plugging in. And it's just, it's fascinating. And, and so I, I, I had an opportunity when I graduated from the class after 10 weeks of um, an hour, two hours every night, I, or rather one night a week for two hours. And, and we, when I was back at my job and I was invited over to the Federal Reserve Bank in Cleveland as part of my job in marketing to work with them on a huge project. They were going to remodel the bank. They're moving everything. They were taking this huge coin vault and moving it somewhere else in the building. I mean, wow, you know. And back then, in those days, we used to, used to transfer money from banks all over the country through a phone line. You dial up a number and send the money. Now, it's much more sophisticated. But at the time, that was it. They had five people that were coming along with me. And I knew three of them. And two of them, I was meeting me the first time. So I did the same thing. Hi, uh, my name is Peter Clausen. I'm Levi. Hi, Levi. How are you? So we went through that with the other two I didn't know. And then we walked into this big, huge meeting room, and there were 70 people around this huge conference table. And I said to myself, wow, this might be a chance to try this out. And so <laughs> when the guy in charge of the meeting stood up and said, let's go around the room, introduce ourselves, and tell us what part of this job you're going to be doing. I said, great. So I, I saw the first person, my name is Levi, and I pictured you and Levi in my mind. All, I had no responsibilities once I had everybody there. I was just there as a to bring other people. They were all knew what they were going to do and, and all ready to go. So I did Levi. You know. And then the next person, my name is Jessica. I actually do this or I'm going to do this, whatever. Levi, Jessica, Levi, Jessica. So I go through these names like this, and I went around the entire room. And did that with each new person that stood up. I started at one and went through to the people we'd done already and finally got up to all 70, having gone through their names. And I said, that's amazing. I never wow. dreamed that was possible. I used to avoid people because I couldn't remember their name. And what I found was that the key element is that one, you have to make sure that you will remember their name instead of I can never remember names. So right. the, the instructor said to the class, never say I can never remember names because you turn your brain off and, and the brain doesn't play ball then. It says, well, that's a job I don't have to worry about. <laughs> and, yeah. and it doesn't. So uh, it's always put that in for, importantly first. So I went around the room probably three, four more times during the two-hour meeting, right? all the way through in my mind. At the end of the, uh, the meeting, I stood up and got to as many people as I could. And in order, so that I had that memorized in service, I said goodbye to them. And I'd say, goodbye, Levi. How'd you know my name? <laughs> and so <laughs> I made a point of it. And number two is I'd said it several times while we had the meeting. And so the whole concept is just incredible what our brains can do if we yes. put them on, in charge of doing the job. I mean, don't tell it. Okay, you can't do this, so don't try. No. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and, yeah, and ever I, since I got to the hospital and, and there were like six, 35, 40 people there and I had all their names every time I'd say to them, how did you do that? I made a point of it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's good. Cause it's that discipline, that focus essentially is what is probably what's helping you with your recovery as well. And obviously our Lord's blessing, but I mean, exactly. that you need, you need that, that determination. Exactly.
And the people there, they'll do anything for you because you've already said, I remember your name. I intentionally remembered your name. And, and you become so important to them just by doing that, that they think more of you and they do more for you. It's a phenomenal aspect. Yeah. It's a pretty basic way to, to show your the self, you know, selflessness and love for someone is, is by recognizing, you know. Exactly. Keeping their name in your mind. Exactly. Right. This has been great, Peter. Is there anything else you want to talk about through the through this experience? I guess about your your faith specifically. Yeah. Talk uh, about your faith. Yeah, it has actually renewed my faith. Now, I have to thank Brother Dave Jennings. We were speaking on the phone last April. And he says, oh, we have a Bible study on in the morning, the Verdugo Hills Bible Study Group. And you'd be welcome to join if you'd like. It's on Zoom and so forth. So I wrote down the address and so forth. And, and the next day, join the class. And I have to tell you that I knew probably three people from that, from that group before. And meeting each of them, and they're all extraordinary brothers and sisters. And having them along with me in my journey and saying, I need, I'm thinking about them. You know, I'd say it's 10, it's 1.30 my time, which is their meeting time at 10.30 on your coast. And so I'd say, oh, they're doing Bible readings. I better make sure. Now, I I usually was at therapy at those times, but I would make sure that when I got back, I would actually take the readings that they did and do them on my own and so forth. So I wanted to stay connected with them and had special connection to others and especially to them because they're wonderful people uh, uh, kind of gave me the incentive to make sure I kept up with the Bible readings. Now, at first I read them to myself and then uh, I realized that I get more out of it when I read out loud as if I was reading for the Zoom call. And so I would start reading out loud and then I would say, okay, let's put some expression into that to, to make these words important and these not so important as over with and really bring this out as if we were doing this to share with other people. They would be interested. They'd be more interested if I made it more like an actual story and I brought it to life. And so I would do that. Now that triggered a lot of things going on in my mind about how I need my faith, how I need to be with them, how we need our brothers and sisters around the world. I receive cards from everywhere and emails and posts on Facebook from everywhere around the world. It was absolutely phenomenal. And that love and care and encouragement can overcome anything. Yeah, I knew I could do it. And I knew with with God's help and with their encouragement, we're going to get through this. So yeah. there was only a brief moment where I said, well, what am I going to do with my life? I can't play the piano anymore. <laughs> I just say that I, I define my life with that, but I do sometimes. <laughs> and at least that's where the ultimate gratitude can come from in sharing God's music with other people and, and bringing it to life. So that has made a huge difference in my life. Yeah, I think and has he, kept me going. And the calls we do each day uh, are the same way. That's wonderful. Yeah, I think it's interesting this year how we've been disconnected, but also more connected. You know, we've lost our in person, so much of our in person time. We've lost right. our singing, but with that and with the blessings of technology, we've really been able to connect in different ways. In some ways, more often and in better ways. But it's still, yeah, I'm looking forward to singing to singing again specifically in a, in a big group and a big place obviously we know it's interesting this disease is so specifically dangerous for that but you've heard earlier on it was church choirs actually that were that were initial spreading events back you exactly know, a year right. ago exactly. and um it's like a specific attack on that part of our life but i'm looking forward to very much that changing that's right the zoom hasn't overcome the ability to try to make music work on on online everything else true. does real well but music yes. doesn't cut it, and it's it doesn't a it, huge yeah. loss. So yeah. uh, vi- videos and things like that are helpful. Yeah, I think it, our, our ecclesia has been meeting on Zoom as well, and I'm always. It feels like every Sunday there's always one moment where you're reminded that it's not perfect. You know, the technology doesn't work exactly right. You know, there's always one. Maybe sometimes there's more, and it's such a funny reminder that we're not meant to meet this way. You know, we're meant to meet all in person. We're not meant to meet this way, but we're thankful that we can. And again, hopefully it's not for much longer. But Exactly. What I find, uh, and I've been back at a meeting, we've had some of us live at meeting for an, a few months now. And the thing that comes up is that one, we're not singing really big, so we're missing that. But this concept of 
having a video playing with music that we sing along, we tend not to be as involved in our singing as the person singing is. It's almost like we're singing along in a concert or whatever. And, yes. and we're not taking the responsibility to actually praise God with our music. We're going through the process of it, but not really involved as much as we should be. And so I've been noticing yeah. how critical that is in order for us to get back to where we used to be, or even improve on what we used to do by saying, ah, now there are new ideas here. We found this out and this out. And how can we be better at what we're doing on Sunday than what we even used to do? So it's a whole new world awaiting us. And with God's blessing, that'll yeah. be soon. And we can praise yeah. him with all of our minds, all of our hearts, all of our voices. It'll be thrilling. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. hope my emotions That's so true. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Peter, for this conversation. I really appreciated it. And I hope I hope it's, it'll be helpful to other people as well. And I, I do I'm as glad, well. I'm, I'm so glad you're doing well and, and uh, improving. And I hope that you continue to do that. I'm looking forward to hearing you play again. I look forward to that as well. Thank you so very much, Levi. And love to everybody we'll all do. around the world in this environment. <laughs> I, I love you. I might not have met you yet, but I love you. And we'll find a time when we can meet even as well and let's make it happen we are so incredibly blessed to have what god has given us and to find a way to make it work every day of our lives yeah thank you peter god bless thank you god bless you as well levi 